ladies and gentlemen. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. The fourth largest city in the United States. It's still growing. Every year we get more of everything. Population, transportation, stores, crime, buildings, and more crime. More than 50,000 major crimes were committed last year alone. That means 50,000 criminals. They range from professional killers to petty thieves. A lot of them are experts. Every year they seem to get better at their jobs. And the better they get, the harder I work. I'm a cop. It was Tuesday, April 28th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of safe detail, burglary division. My partner's Ed Jacobs. The boss is Captain Wisdom. My name's Friday. It was 2.16 p.m. when we got back to the Hall of Justice, Superior Court, Department 38. On January 4th, the safe in the Grant Harrell building was burglarized. It took us weeks before we narrowed down the suspects to one man. He was an ex-con, a two-time loser. It took more weeks of interrogation, gathering evidence, long hours in the crime lab to build our case against him. It was a big job, a hard one. He was guilty. We were convinced of it. We had one step to go. It was the jury. We had to convince them. <laughs> Got him, Joe. Did you testify yet? This morning. How'd it work out? Physical evidence tied in perfectly. All six points. Mm -hmm. Jury impressed? Hard to tell. Buckley's got a smart lawyer. I was talking to the assistant DA. The case ought to go to the jury late today. What's coming up next, Joe? I'm due back on the stand when this recess is over. There's the bailiff. The Superior Court is again now in session. Remain seated. No smoking, please. Could show that the jury, the defendant, and his counsel are present. The prosecution may proceed. If it please, Your Honor, I'd like to recall Leland Jones to the stand. Leland Jones, take the stand. <laughs> Be seated. If I may, Your Honor, for the benefit of the record, state that Leland B. Jones has been duly sworn. That counsel for the defense has stipulated that he's a forensic chemist attached to the Scientific Investigation Division of the Los Angeles Police Department and that he's qualified to testify as an expert in the case. Proceed. Mr. Jones, earlier today in this court, you heard the testimony to the effect that Conrad Buckley had identified these exhibits as his own. This wool jacket, this pair of trousers, and these shoes, did you not? I did. This morning, Mr. Jones, you pointed out these pertinent facts about these articles of clothing. First, People's Exhibit 1, the red paint smudges on the soles of the shoes. They match the paint on the ventilation pipe, which leads to the third floor of the Grant Herald building. Is that correct? That is correct. You further stated that the footprints left at the scene of the crime were made by a size 8 shoe with Cuban heels and metal taps on each toe. Is that correct? That's right. People's Exhibit 1. A pair of black shoes identified by the defendant as his own. They're stamped size 8, Cuban heels, metal taps on each toe. Mr. Jones, you're acquainted with the fact that on the night of January 4th, someone scaled the ventilator pipe at the third floor of the Grant Herald building, forcibly entered the attic of the building, gained access to an adjoining suite of offices, and there burglarized the safe. I'm acquainted with that fact. Is it possible that someone else other than the defendant could have burglarized that safe? In my opinion, no. On what do you base your conclusion? I base it on the application of the law of probabilities to such a case as this. Would you explain that to the jury, please? First, um... Let's apply a set of figures to these facts. Let's say, conservatively, that one man in every hundred in this city wears a size 8 shoe with Cuban heels and metal taps on the shoes. And then, let's say that one man in every hundred has red paint smudges on the soles of his shoes. Same color and same texture as the paint from the building. Uh, further, let's estimate that one man in a hundred also wears ten ribs to the inch, woven trousers, and a wool jacket woven twelve ribs to the inch. Let's also estimate that one man in a hundred carries a small piece of charred lath in his jacket. 
Then let's say that one man in a hundred carries in the cuffs of his trousers particles of plaster similar to the plaster in the attic of the Grand Herald building. What are the chances then that one man in this city, other than the defendant, could possess all six of these various items? That would be one chance in one trillion. Well, how do you arrive at that figure, Mr. Jones? Well, simply by multiplying 100 by itself six times over. You mean only one man in one trillion, other than the defendant, could have burglarized the safe on the third floor of the Grand Herald building? That's correct. One trillion. Can you give the jury something to compare that figure with? That's more people than have lived on Earth since the beginning of time. Lee Jones was the last witness to testify in the case of the state versus Conrad Buckley. For the rest of the afternoon, the defense lawyer and the assistant DA delivered their summations. The defense lawyer was eloquent and colorful. He spoke for more than an hour and threw up every possible smoke screen he could think of to disguise the facts of the case. The assistant DA reviewed again the six points of physical evidence clearly defined. At five minutes to five that afternoon, the case went to the jury. We were expecting a quick verdict. We didn't get it. The jury was locked up for the night, and we went home. The Superior Court, State of California, and for the County of Los Angeles is now in session. The Honorable John Edwards, judge presiding. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? Yes, Your Honor, we have. Hand me the verdict. Read the verdict. The Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles People versus Conrad Buckley. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant not guilty. No talking back there, please. So say you want to say all, is this your verdict? It is. Record the verdict. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I've been a judge for 26 years. For the past 14 years, I've presided in this particular court. May I say now that this is the worst miscarriage of justice I have ever witnessed. After hearing your verdict in this case, I can arrive at only one conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, either you are innately dishonest or you're complete morons. Court's adjourned. <laughs> As soon as possible, the district attorney's office began exploring the personal life and background of each one of the 12 jurors. They contacted their neighbors, their friends, their acquaintances. They checked back 10 years in the lives of every one of them. They found nothing. The jury was indifferent. They wouldn't follow the case. Well, all the facts were there, Lee. None of the jurors were fixed. The DA's office found out that much. Why wouldn't they follow the case? A lot of people think they're doing their city a big favor when they serve on a jury. Yeah. They figure all they have to do is sit in the jury box for a few days, mark a ballot as fast as they can, and then leave. Beats me. They pay the taxes. They pay for these trials. They can follow the technical case closely if they want to. A lot of them aren't that conscientious. They don't think it means money in their pocket, so they don't care. We went through hell on this thing. Four months to catch him, three months to prove him guilty? And the jury blew it. You want my opinion, Lee? I think it stinks. You don't have an opinion, Joe. You're a cop. The case of Conrad Buckley became just another item filed away with hundreds of thousands of others in the record bureau of the Los Angeles Police Department. Six days after he was acquitted, he left the city and a few weeks later was reported in Baltimore, Maryland. After that, he dropped from sight. Summer came, autumn, Christmas, New Year's. On Wednesday morning, Ed and I checked in for work as usual. What's the date, Ed? Wednesday, February 1st. Thank you. Your mother get over that cold, Joe? Yeah, finally. How about your kid? Yeah, he's okay. Wife's got one now. Hi. Morning, Ed. Hi. You got a minute? Yeah. Carter Printing Company was robbed last night. How much? There's the crime report. 14,500. Yeah, it's a big haul. Yeah, most familiar. Climbed a drain pipe to the roof, kicked in a skylight. Yeah. 
Conrad Buckley's back in town. I think it might add up. Could be. Sounds like it. There's one sure way to make him. Put him in small words and big type. I don't know how to make it any more positive than the last time. I don't know if that Greek with a lamp ever found an honest man, but get the guy. <laughs> Ed and I drove out to the Cotter Printing Company and spent the rest of the morning and most of that afternoon checking into the $14,000 safe burglary. We examined the office where the burglary took place and the smashed skylight where the thief entered. We traced his path from the time he got into the building to the time he left. No fingerprints, no leads. How many safe men you know that work like Buckley? Well, let's see. There's Hagen. He works about the same, but he's up at Q. Walters, he operates like Buckley. He's doing time, too. Anybody else? No, not that I can think of. All right, find Buckley. Find out where he lives, who his friends are, where he eats. Find out what he's doing. You want us to tail him? Give him plenty of room. When you get the dope on him, we'll have a squad of men tail him alternately. All right. Where do we start? The Manchester Bar, down on Central Avenue near 5th. When was he there last? Monday. First night he got in town. Might be his favorite spot. Okay. Anything else? I hear Buckley's learned a new trick since he's been away. Yeah? Carries a gun. That night, Ed and I started down into the south end of the city to find Conrad Buckley. First stop was Comanche's bar. Buckley didn't show. The next night was the same. And the night after that, no sign. On the fourth night, at ten minutes past eight p.m., Saturday, February 4th, Ed spotted Buckley entering. We waited. At 25 minutes past midnight, Buckley came out the main entrance with a blonde woman on his arm. He walked unsteadily. The two of them got into a gray car and sat there talking. What's the license number, Joe? 9 Robert 702. Want to get a make? Yeah. Control 1, request a rolling make in the 3 column. 9 Robert 702. 9 Robert 702. Roger, 80K. Stand by. KMA 367. It's a nice-looking car. Yeah, if it's his. Might pan out if we're lucky. Control 1 to 80K. Come in. 80K to Control 1. Go ahead. 9 Robert 702. Car registered to Mrs. Conrad Buckley. 939 South Norwich Road, Beverly Hills. 80K to Control 1. Roger. KMA 367. What does that prove? It proves he's supporting a new car and a wife. Let's find out how. a.m. We trailed Buckley and the blonde woman we figured to be his wife to 939 South Norwich Road in Beverly Hills. We waited. At 3 a.m., Ed called Captain Wisdom and a couple of men were sent out to relieve us. By Friday of that week, February 10th, we had his movements fairly well established. We turned all the information we had over to Captain Wisdom and he assigned a crew of eight men to tail the suspect constantly in alternate shifts. The trap was set. 6 p.m. Tuesday, February 14th. I'll get it. Friday talking. Yeah, Captain, what's up? Uh-huh, yeah, right. Buckley, he's making a move. We left the city hall and drove out to the site of the stakeout near Buckley's home on South Norwich Road. Captain Wisdom was there waiting for us. He left his place alone. He was on foot. Bergen Marconi tailed him to a bar. That's where he lost him. And he hasn't come back to his place? Not yet. I got a hunch you will. His car's still there. Yeah. We can shake him down. If he's been out on a caber tonight, he should have whatever he stole with him. Uh -huh. Car there in the driveway? No. Check the license. Uh -huh. Nine Robert 702, that's Buckley's car. There's somebody coming out of the house. That his wife? Looks like it. Does she know either one of you? No. Follow her. Yeah, let's go in. <laughs> Miss 
okay? Can you see the door from here? Yeah, this is fine. Captain? So we move, let's sweat it out. The blonde woman entered the apartment house at 1261 Wilcox Avenue at 14 minutes past 11 p.m. At five minutes past midnight, she came out and got in her car. A man was with her. Buckley. Must be the hideout. You two follow them. When they get to the house, shake them down. What about you? I'll check the apartment. Meet you back at the office. Right. At 21 minutes past midnight, Ed and I pulled up at the Buckley home at 939 South Norwich Road. We waited until Buckley and his wife got in the house. Then we went in and shook him down. We found nothing. We searched the house, the garage, and the car. The same. Nothing. Yeah, all right. You can put your stuff away. Place is clean, Joe. Nothing. Right. And I tell you, I'm clean. You haven't got one thing on me. I'm clean. It's a nice car you're driving, Buckley. Is it yours? That's right. I like nice things. They cost money. What well, doesn't? When did you get back in town? Last week. Why? What are you doing with your time? Morris Cabinet Company. I'm a journeyman carpenter. When do you work? Nights. Good job. Believe me, I'm legit. All right, you stay that way and we won't have any trouble. Ed and I left Buckley's house, drove back to the office and checked in with Captain Wisdom. He told us that he had talked with the manager of the apartment house at 1261 Wilcox Avenue. Buckley was renting apartment 7A in the building under the name of James E. Wilson. On the average, he used the apartment only once or twice each week. The rent was $75 a month. What'd you find in the apartment, Captain? He keeps two complete changes of clothes in the closet. The rest of the place is empty except for one thing, set of burglary tools. Yeah. Found them under a false bottom drawer. Set of safe jimmies, small sledge, the works. Then he works out of the apartment, huh? He's getting cagey, or he thinks he is. After a job, he probably comes back to the apartment, gets rid of his work clothes, and figures he's pretty safe. Well, and all we have to do is keep an eye on that apartment. The next time he pulls a job, we grab him. That's right. The next time we pick him up, it's going to be for keeps. That depends on the jury, doesn't it? At 3 a.m. that morning, Wisdom ordered a stakeout at 1261 Wilcox Avenue. The stakeout on his home also continued. During the next week, the suspect was seen to come and go from his home, and on two occasions, he visited his apartment during the daylight hours. No suspicious moves on his part were reported. The stakeout went on. Five weeks later, on March 22nd, the safe in the offices of Butterfield and Crucian Wholesale Grocers was burglarized of $7,500. That afternoon, Wisdom, Ed, and I met with Lieutenant Lee Jones in the crime lab. It's cyclohexane, a coal tar product. Well? Yeah. It's colorless and it's odorless. When it's rubbed into the surface of an object, it's invisible to the naked eye. Well, what about it, Lee? It's a crystalline hydrocarbon, slightly soluble in ether or alcohol. Uh-huh. Well, here, let me show you this cloth. I help you, Lee? Yeah, will you, Joe? And there. Dust it on here. Now, can you see or feel anything at all? No. Seems to disappear. You can't feel anything. Can you can. Oh. Ed? No. No, nothing on it. Captain, there. you want to catch that light, please? Sure. Have a look. How about that? Seems to glow. Yeah. Hmm. Will this stuff rub off, Lee? Try it. Now look at your hands. Nothing harmful in that stuff? No. How long will this stuff stay on, Lee? Maybe as long as 24 hours. Only shows up under that ultraviolet lamp. Huh? That's right. Well, does it work on everybody? It'll work on Buckley. Ten minutes later, Wisdom put in a call to the two men on stake out at Buckley's apartment on Wilcox Avenue. They reported that the apartment was empty. Buckley hadn't been near it since early the day before. At 6 p.m. that night, Lee Jones, Ed and I went to the apartment, let ourselves in with a pass key, and went to work with two jars of cyclohexane. We dusted it on everything in sight on Buckley's clothes, his shoes, his hat, and on the set of burglary tools which we found in the false bottom drawer. We rubbed it in until it was invisible. 
We arranged everything exactly the way we found it. And then we went back to the office. Lee Jones had a portable ultraviolet light set up for immediate use. Wisdom alerted communications to pass along immediately all reports of burglaries throughout the city. We waited. At midnight, we went out in ships for sandwiches and coffee. The watch kept on. 2.30 a.m. I got it. Wisdom. Yeah? Thanks. Harvard and Wilshire Boulevard. Safe job? Two of them. Call Lee Jones. I'll meet you downstairs. Right. What do you think? We'll let the lamp tell us. Bergstrom, keep the storefront clear. Ten feet on either side. Anything, Lee? You'll know in a minute. Okay, Bob. All right, we can try it. I'll get the light, Lee. Buckley's house, Lee Jones directed the photographer to stay at the scene of the burglary and take photographs of the telltale cyclohexane prints and all other pertinent photographs for use in court. At eight minutes past 4 a.m., we walked into Buckley's living room. Now, look, this is kind of getting on my nerves. It's four in the morning. Ed, now let's right down there. Right. Where's all that stuff? What's that you got? Okay. Right, Lee. Okay, Joe, the light. What's this all about, anyway? Look at yourself. What are you doing to me? What is all this stuff? Like a Christmas tree. Yeah. I don't have to take this stuff. You haven't got anything on me. You had me in court once before, and you had to turn me loose. Yes, we had you in court, and I can tell you every move you made in that case. Yeah? You tell me if I'm wrong. You climbed the back of the Grand Herald building using some pipes as supports. You crawled across the roof on your hands and knees to the firewall. You raised up a couple of times to see if everything was clear. You went over the firewall, leaving impressions of your coat and trousers. One of the coat buttons was scratched, so you went over stomach down. You then went to the front of the building, walking in a crouched position to see if there were any police cars in the vicinity. Then you returned to the skylight. How am I doing? Keep talking. You removed the glass from the skylight, crawled through the entrance, kicked a hole through a plaster wall into the attic. You broke some of the charred laths so that you could crawl through the attic to an opening in the office of the Grant Harrow building. Then you opened the safe and took out $1,250. Is that right? No, I took $1,350. Okay. You give me a couple of hours and I'll tell you what you did on this case. Here's your coat. Yeah. What about my clothes? They're all ruined. By the time you need them again, they'll be out of style. All right, come on, let's go. On October 15th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 84, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and convicted of first-degree burglary. Due to his previous convictions, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. Uh, 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 uh,